great things about this conference is it gives everyone an opportunity to step back away from the day-to-day uh, -day moves and take a look at the big picture here. So big picture, how much conviction do you guys see across asset classes right now? Because the volatility, pickup in volatility we've seen would suggest that there's uh, divergences of opinions which would set us apart from, say, 2017. Right. Tom, why don't we start with you? Yeah, I think it's true. Obviously, you saw in the first quarter volatility spike. Now, some of that was driven by technical factors around some funds. But the reality is we got tax reform. People are going to start watching numbers, and they're going to look for signals. In the meantime, you get some negative comments out of the industrial sector, and you see that sector trade off. So I think equity markets, after a pretty sustained run, are starting to step back a little, and that's probably not a bad thing. So we would say that there is, unfortunately, a real confusion between risk and volatility, and they are not the same thing. Most of our investors are long-term investors, and for them, actually, a little volatility is no bad thing. Is it we, good for them? It actually, in many ways, is good for them. We've looked, actually, at the last 26 spikes in volatility, and what you find is the market basically comes back, on average, in about seven months. And so the biggest risk that many of our clients face is how do you put money to work in a market where everything is richly priced? And so they actually are looking to take advantage of volatility to help them get a better entry point. So over the long term, the mark-to-market of assets is not a big issue for our clients, and volatility actually can be a positive for them when used appropriately. Is it a good entry point right now? I mean, if you look across different asset classes, let's just start with credit, for instance. Is this a good entry point right now? We're getting closer, without, without a doubt. Um, you know, we have been uh, of the belief for a number of years that uh, interest rates will remain historically low. And yes, you can see the rates are beginning to come up, as they should, and as the Fed begins to tighten. But we do not believe that we will go back to historic levels. And so when rates are going over the 10-year at over three, we actually are adding to the portfolio. Yeah, I, I would agree. And maybe look at this way. When you think about credit, you know, there's two elements. There's certainly rates and duration, which you might not want to be too long duration. And that's where you start selecting credit, like high yield, where when you look at high yield, spreads gap out a little bit with the trade-off first quarter. Uh, but we don't really try to time the market so much credit. We look at the fundamentals. We still like the fundamentals in credit. In particular, we see broad default rates as being still very low. Yeah, we would, we would agree with that. The big, the big uh, I think, event, though, is the flattening of the curve. And uh, we're, we can argue about exactly the level it hits, but we've been on, on a flattener, and we've been betting on a flattener for the last year, and we think that will continue. And so I think investors should position themselves for that. And the big question is, do we actually get to one that's inverted? And what will that, what will that mean? Do, do you see that happening, Tom? Yeah, we don't so much in our investing bet as much on the curve. We're, we're heavily weighted to taking the credit risk at the end of the day. But I would agree with David. We don't see rates materially spike. And I think they're trying to find a new level. And, and the curve clearly is going to be flat for a period of time. Now, one of the things that happens, of course, at Milken is that there's a lot of deal making on the sidelines. There's a panel, sure, everyone goes to that, including the one that Tom and I were in. But there's a lot of conversations taking place on the side. And David, you were observing that in years past, there's a lot of conversation about the Federal Reserve, whether it was making a mistake, whether it was raising interest rates too quickly, the ECB, its positioning. Um, but this year, the conversation's different. It's very much focused on political risk. It really has been remarkably different. Um, I would say the last three Milken have been very much more about the macro economy mm -hmm. and about uh, Fed or ECB or the Bank of Japan policy. I've heard almost none of that uh, at, at this conference. People largely know where the Fed is headed. Uh, the general macro economy is obviously very good. And so the focus is absolutely around trade risk, around Brexit and how that begins to play out, around the Korean Peninsula. And so the political dynamics of this have really taken a much more prominent role. And how do you advise clients on that then? How do, what questions do they ask you that you can offer them actionable advice on? Well, it's interesting. Two-thirds of our clients come from outside the United States. In fact, about a third in Asia, a third in Europe, and a third in America. So we often get the questions, to your point, about the political risk, about you know, the policies, about the tweets, quite frankly. And you know what, what we remind clients is, you know, 
we can't necessarily say this policy will end up with this outcome because a lot of this is early stages, even trade. It's a little positioning. It's, it, there's going to be a process here. So we remind them we're looking at the fundamentals. Now, we may say within an industry, if they're at risk with a bad trade deal, you have to take that into account with other factors when you're doing your investing. But it's tricky because there's no blueprint for this. There's no template for this, right? I mean, it's similar in a way to watching the Fed unwind monetary stimulus because we've never done it before. It was an experiment. In the same way, we don't know how this administration is going to behave because it's proven that the precedents that have been set up in the past don't matter. Right. But we, but we do know that there is an unprecedented level of political risk between developed countries. So it used to be that people would think there is political risk with Argentina, yes. or Mexico, yeah. but Brexit was a fascinating case study. So we worked with a lot of our clients after that to figure out what was their real exposure to the UK. Yeah. And people thought, well, maybe it's the FTSE. Well, it turns out the FTSE actually is largely made up of companies that make a lot of their revenue outside of the UK. What was their real estate holdings? How much of companies outside the UK depended on trade with the UK? And so actually helping people to disaggregate their portfolio into country risk is not an easy task. But when you do do it, you can see the very significant levels of risk that people didn't even know that they uh, had. So you're looking under the hood, basically, right. and breaking yeah, it all that, down. That's true. And, I, and I'd add another element today about why the risk is different politically. In, in, in 07 or 08, uh, President Bush was able to bring together the G20, and they dealt with the global crisis as a group. I don't know that you, if we were faced with a similar crisis, that you have that type of cohesiveness in the global community. And yeah, you know, that's an unforeseen risk. Given all the political risk, especially from developed nations, should developed nations' assets be priced like emerging market assets? I mean, that, that's, that, those are places where political risk run rampant all the time. I think it's a great it's a great point, and of course the place you see that the most is in the foreign exchange market. Yes. So, just to use Brexit again as an example, the one price that really did move after that was, was sterling, mm -hmm. and uh, I think you did see that reprice the UK, and we'll see that again uh, as we look around the world and we have these events. You will see very sudden moves of, of the FX markets. Yeah. Well, I agree. I think I think there's a lot of mispricing at times between developed and emerging markets. Right now, we'd be probably be more constructive on the emerging markets because even with a slight slowdown in China, we see some good fundamentals playing out over the next few years. You know, in a globalizing economy, some of the old paradigms are starting to break down, and I don't know that the market price already, already, always reflects that. We would certainly agree with that. I think Tom's point is a great one that, you know, the emerging markets really are very different than they were, and the amount of trade and commerce that's happening within them rather than between developed is growing much more rapidly. And so our investing is absolutely geared toward a higher weighting in emerging markets looking out over the next 10 years. Is that what you call that, your highest conviction? trade right now? Well, I think that it's a, it's a high conviction trade over time. The problem, as we were talking about earlier, is when to get in. Yes. And I think we're not yet there, but we will be, I think, before long. What needs to happen for, for that moment to strike? What's, what needs to happen for that moment to strike, for the time to be right to get in then? Well, again, I think it depends on what market you're talking about, what, the, what is the stimulus for it. You know, um, I think you saw some entry points in certain markets just in the first quarter when credit markets came off a little, though they did not trade off as much as equities. What we try to do is really continue to evaluate the fundamentals of the market we're looking at, whether that's a sovereign market or a corporate market. And sometimes your entry points have nothing to do with the broad indices or value in certain companies, sectors, or even uh, emerging countries.